started. If you want to grab a seat. Thanks for joining us this evening. Welcome. Um, just a, I guess a reminder. Uh, I think the only one today is that uh, you can always go out to our website, kennelchurch.org slash theology. So that's where we have our recordings, um, our slides, if you miss a session. I know sometimes the discussion we have here is like awesome, and then it's like super short, and it's like, oh, we didn't get to finish. Uh, so the discussion questions are on the slides online too. So if you want to uh, circle back or uh, you know, bring them to your small group or something, that, that is an option for you. Um, but as you know, we're doing approachable theology, and uh, we've said that theology is the study of God, right? And we've been talking about how our understanding of God, of who he is, impacts our life, right? It impacts the way we live, um, and with a proper understanding of who God is, it will lead us to humility, and it will lead us to worship God. Um, the way that we primarily learn about God is through his word, the Bible, right? And uh, we've seen that his word is trustworthy, and that's how we see a God who is great, right? He's very uh, awesome and different than us. He's eternal. He's all-powerful. He's also a good God. He's loving. He's holy. He's just. Um, but when we, when we look at theology, we don't just talk about who God is, we also look at what he has done. And so that's going to be the topic of our next couple sessions, um, the concept of creation. So today, specifically, what we're going to talk about is humanity, mankind. So God created us. That's one of the actions that he has done. And as we study God, you know, this is a particular topic where, you know, in one sense, we become the subject, right? We, we're seeing okay, God, what, what has he done? He has, he has created us. And, and so, you know, we answer questions like, who are we? And, you know, why are we here? How did we get here? And, you know, what should I do? How should I relate to these other people that God has created? Sometimes that, you know, are very different than me and that think things very differently than I do. And, you know, questions like, what do we do with this Humanity is kind of like a, a contradiction in a sense. You know, we're, we're capable of doing these awesome things, right? We travel to space. We can send a message all the way across the world in an instant. And yet we are so angry at people. And we murder people. And we're selfish. So what's up with that? Right? And... Um, so we're going to try to look at some of those things tonight, and we're, we're going to start by uh, looking at how others view what a human is, um, and then we'll see, you know, what the Bible says, and then we'll spend a big chunk of our time um, tonight digging into the, the concept of the image of God um, and its implications, and then we'll end up with a look at the makeup of humans, what, what, what are humans made up of. So... Uh, with that, we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Lord, we do uh, thank you for being a great God, for being a good God. And we do thank you for um, your word once again. And we do look to it tonight. And I ask that you would speak to us through it, that you would accomplish your purposes with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so first we're going to run through a few of the alternative views of humanity. So some people view humans basically as a machine, right? They exist to do things. Um, they exist to produce, to output. And, you know, maybe this is uh, the perspective of your employer, right? They care about you, but kind of so you get your work done and, you know, they want you to be okay, but kind of like, so you get your work done, <laughs> right? Um, you know, so it's all about efficiency and productivity and, and humanity, you know, humans can be viewed as a means to an end. 
Um, and, you know, we see this attitude in the world, but it can also creep into the church, this idea of like, you know, who's going to get the work done here, right? Who's going to be my great leader that's going to help lead this ministry? Um, or, you know, seeing people as, uh, as giving units, you know, how are we going to help pay for this expansion, right? That's uh, not, not okay, not good. Um, another view is that basically humans are animals, right? Um, our brains might be a little bigger, we might be a little more complex, but basically uh, mankind is just, uh, just an animal, nothing more than that. Um, another view is that we are simply sexual beings. Uh, so Sigmund Freud came up with a whole philosophy of mankind um, and said that sexuality was the key to understanding human nature. And, you know, personality, behavior, it's all just based on sex and how that is handled in someone's life. And while the, the theories of Freud never quite took off, um, it'd be hard to argue that sex is not one of the dominant preoccupations of our culture, right? It's assumed that, you know, sex is the most significant aspect of our lives as humans. Nothing sells without sex. And, you know, now we're talking about, you know, this is the core of, our, of who we are. This is our identity, our sexual identity. That's who I am. And, you know, that's why, you know, different sins, whether it's you know, sex before marriage or homosexuality or pornography, you know, uh, that doesn't really matter, the world says. Like, those are just needs that need to be met. We're just sexual beings. Not, not correct either. Um, others would, um, kind of all, along similar lines, view humanity as basically a free being. So, um, the, our, our, our human will is the essence of personality, of, of what it means to be human. And so the most important thing in life is for me to be able to do whatever I want, right? No one can tell me what to do, not you know, my culture, not my religion, um, certainly not any politician. I am the captain of my soul, right? I'm going to do me, and that's, that's what matters. So free being. Uh, kind of the flip side is, you know, humans are nothing more than a pawn of the universe. You know, we are nothing. The universe is going to do its thing, and there's nothing we can do about it. You know, sometimes, you know, some people would view this as, like, the blind forces of the universe, um, while other times, you know, people might see, okay, this is, you know, there, there's someone doing something, but, you know, it's like the man, right? The government, the, the people in power, they're, they're doing their thing, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Um, basically a defeatist attitude. There's nothing I can do that, that will impact anything. Um, you know, the world doesn't care. That it's, it's, or it's out, out to get us. Um, but basically you just have to accept the reality of can't do anything. So... Those are some common uh, perceptions about what humans are, uh, what's most defining about us. And you probably heard some of these at least, you know, um, you know, a, a concept of it, uh, maybe not in these terms. And, you know, maybe sometimes we can even feel these ways of this is what is most important. Um, but who are we really? What is humanity? And the answer to this is we are creatures of God, made in his image and likeness and for fellowship with him. We are creatures of God, made in his image and likeness and for fellowship with him. God created us. At the very beginning of the Bible, we see God creating, right? He calls forth the light and the land. He creates, you know, plants and animals. And then uh, we'll look at uh, chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26.
Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the biblical answer is that this all-powerful God, this good God that we've been talking about, this loving God, freely chose to create the human race, to love him and, and to enjoy a relationship with him. That's who we are, and that's why we're here. We're not just a machine. We're not just animals. We are creatures of God. And uh, in our next session, um, so yeah, in two weeks, Trevor is going to get uh, more into creation, specifically creation versus evolution. Um, but for now, the point is that God created us. God created humanity. He did it on purpose. He created mankind. Um, and we are going to get into the image of God, like I said, but before we do that, um, Erickson in, in the book draws out um, the theological meaning of creation. So just based on the fact that God created us, um, you know, what does that tell us? And so we'll, we'll go through some of these. So one is that humans have no independent existence. Uh, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the greatness of God, right, where God didn't need anything to exist. He's God. We needed to be created, right? Uh, we need, we have needs. God doesn't. Um, but this also reveals part of our, our identity. You know, we aren't just the kids of our parents, and we aren't just creatures. We, a, a good, great God created us. Um, next, humans are a part of creation. Um, so God created us right along with everything else, right? And in one sense, we are more similar to everything else in creation than to God, right? We, we are creation. God is creator. Um, also, as part of God's creation, we should exercise good stewardship over the rest of creation, of the creation to which we belong. Uh, humans are unique in creation. So while we are a part of the creation, we are created in God's image. We, we are the ones that are to exercise dominion over the rest of creation. For there's kinship among humans. So we all come from the original man and woman. And so we're all related. And with that, we should have empathy towards all humans. Uh, next, humanity is not the highest object in the universe. So right, God is the highest being. Um, and we have great value, but we have great value because a great God has conferred that value onto us. Everything we have comes from God, whether that's our ability or strength, anything else. Um, it's been given by God, and it's to God's glory. And, it's all about God's glory. You know, our pleasure is not the most important thing. Uh, humanity is limited. So, you know, creatures are finite. Only the creator is infinite. Um, we can't know everything. And so as we go about our lives and act and think, we have to do so with humility, understanding that we don't know it all. Um, and limitation is not necessarily bad. Uh, this is an interesting concept, I think. Um, you know, at the end of creation, before the fall, you know, when man was human and a creature, God said it was good. And uh, so, you know, limitations aren't necessarily all the result of sin. Um, a lot of times we sin when we fail to recognize our limitations. And, you know, some people think that, oh, if we could only, um, you know, develop more capabilities, then, you know, we, we wouldn't sin as much. Um, but really what we see is we just find more ways of sinning, right? Um, and then contentment requires accepting our finiteness. So, you know, we need to let God be God. 
We don't know it all. And so we're in no place to tell God what is right or what he should do or what should have happened. And this requires humility. Um, But it also provides freedom because we don't have to always be right. We don't have to fear failure because only God never fails. You know, only God never makes mistakes. And, you know, we don't have to make excuses for our shortcomings. We don't have to get all defensive about not being perfect because we are finite humans and and we don't need to be God because there already is a God. And, you know, if we don't accept that, if we're trying to be like God or have it all under our control or know it all or pretend like we know it all, then uh, we're just going to be disappointed and frustrated because that's not who we are. That's not who we're supposed to be. What we were intended to be are limited human creatures. And if we accept that, if we live in light of that, contentment is possible. Uh, And then with that, humanity is wonderful. So even with that being said, even, uh, you know, in our finiteness and our struggles and limitations, mankind is great. We are the highest of God's creatures. And we have accomplished a lot. Um, But really what makes us great is that a great God created us. Um, And so here we can look at uh, Psalms 100. Yeah. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Praise God. Okay, next we're going to get into the image of God. The image of God. Um, So you may have heard of, uh, also referred to as the imago Dei. So that's the Latin uh, for this theological concept, uh, being created in the image of God. Um, But we're going to go back actually to Genesis here, where we were. Um, Yeah, so then, then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. In our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish and the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So, you know, what does this mean, the image of God? Man in the image of God means that man is like God and that man represents God. Man is like God, man represents God. Um, You know, the words image and likeness, they refer to something that's similar, but not the same. And so we're similar, but we're not the same as God. And that leads us to this idea of, you know, when God wanted to create something like him, he created us. You know, he he made humans. Man is like God, man represents God. and there's been a lot of debate throughout church history about, you know, what specific ways is man like God? You know, what's, what's the core of what it means to be like God? Um, and so we're going to go over a few of these. Uh, so basically, you know, what's, what's the most important thing about humans that is like God? Um, and so some will say the most important thing is who we are. Uh, this is called the substantive view. So, um, yeah, you know, who are we? What, what are we made of? Um, and so, since only man is said to have been created in the image of God, uh, people look to see, okay, what's unique about mankind, um, about who he is, compared to the rest of creation? And one of the most common ways, uh, things that people uh, talk about here is the use of reason, right? So uh, we see in scripture, God is a God of reason. You look out in the animal kingdom, you know, not necessarily reason. We use reason, so that must be what it is uh, to, to bear God's image. 
Um, others will see that you know, God is free. Um, and so as we exercise our free will, that's what it means to be in the image of God. Um, or because God is holy, um, our moral consciousness is what um, it means for us to bear God's image, you know, to, to, to live rightly. Uh, but basically, those are the approaches that, um, you know, it, who we are or what, yeah, who we are that, that, me, that is the image of God. Uh, others will place the emphasis on what we do. So that's called the functional view. Um, and so, you know, here with this verse again, they say, you know, God is sovereign. He rules and he created us to act on his behalf, right, in ruling creation. Um, you know, we are to be his representatives and subdue the earth, um, have dominion over it. And so that's what it means to, to uh, have the image of God. Another one here is that we can relate or this, the relational view. Um, so basically God exists in relationship, right? With the Trinity, you know, let us create God, the Father, Son, Spirit. Um, he created us to have relationship with him. He created us to have relationship with one another, you know, male and female, he created us. Um, and, you know, we see these different ideas of, of what does it mean? What does it really mean? You know, what's the most important aspect? Uh, of this, I think, uh, so Wayne Grudem makes a helpful point here, I think, um, where he, he draws a connection here with Genesis 5, 3. So this is when um, it talks about Adam having a kid. And uh, it says, when Adam had lived 130 years old, 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named his Seth. So like it's using this, these same words, you know, it's the image of, uh, the image of Adam uh, in the likeness of Adam. Um, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily say what exact ways was Seth like Adam. You know, it's not like, oh, it was his curly hair or, you know, his brown eyes or, you know, maybe he had a quick temper. Um, you know, anything that Seth had that was like Adam were the ways that he was like Adam, right? And so uh, in a similar way, everything that we are and that we do that is like God, that's that's what the image of God is. That's what it means to be like God um, and, to, and to represent God. Um, and so, yes, God is a God of relationship, and he created us to relate to him. That's part of it. Um, but that's not the only thing, because, you know, what about the atheists or the person on a desert island who isn't in relation with anybody, right? They still bear the image of God. They're, they're human. And, yes, God exercises dominion. Um, and we are to be his, you know, co-workers or, or vice regents uh, ruling over creation. But, um, you know, the one who isn't able to work or do those things doesn't, you know, hasn't lost the image of God. They're still humans. Um, and so it's not, it's not just that either. Uh, it's also who we are, who God has made us to be. And um, it seems like if we were to just pick one of these, it would be over, overly restrictive because we do represent God. Um, in, in many ways. Um, we do represent him in the moral aspect, right? We are to be holy because God is holy. Um, there's the spiritual aspect of God has given us a spirit and he has made us spiritual beings. And, um, you know, we, we will as spiritual beings live forever. Yes, there is a mental aspect. We can reason and, and think logically and engage in abstract reasoning, right? We use abstract language. Uh, we have an awareness of our distant future. Uh, we demonstrate creativity in art and music and literature and scientific advancements. Um, and so there are various ways that we are like God. There are various ways of um, how we have a likeness of God, of of who God created us to be. Um, now, we certainly don't do this perfectly. Um, you know, in Genesis 3, we read about the fall. You know, Adam and Eve uh, sinned. The world was broken. It was cursed. And so as a result of that, you know, there was this distortion. There was, um, yeah, there was a distortion of our likeness of God and our representation of God. And, um, 
that's why, you know, even as we have more advancements, we still sin and just find new ways of sinning, of harming others. Uh, we have been broken. Our world has been broken. Um, and we have inherited a sin nature from our first parents. And this has led some people to ask, you know, is there any of, it, of the image of God left in us? You know, has it just been completely destroyed? Um, do we still bear any similarities to God or represent him at all? Um, but yeah, what we see is that even after the fall, um, humans still do bear God's likeness. So, you know, in Genesis 9, God tells Noah, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. So even after the fall, um, you know, man still bore enough of the image of God that murder is wrong. It's such an attack on someone who bears God's image um, that even capital punishment can be allowed. Why? Because even after the fall, God, um, even after the fall, man still bears God's image. Uh, we also see in the New Testament, uh, James 3, 9, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Right? So people still bear the likeness of God, and that's why we shouldn't curse them. So even after the fall, um, humans still bear the image of God, even though it has been distorted. Um, and Erickson makes the point here of why this is helpful to look at Jesus, because Jesus was not impacted by the fall, uh, did not have a sinful nature. He was really human, um, but he lived the way humans are really supposed to live. And so um, that's why, you know, we can look to Jesus to see, okay, how should we live our lives? Uh, what characterized his life? Because he, he was the perfect human. And so when we do that, you know, what do we see in Jesus' life? Well, one, he had perfect fellowship with the Father, right? He, he said, I am in the Father, Father's in me, we are one. Obviously, there's a little distinction there with being a member of the Trinity, but uh, uh, he, he had a perfect uh, yeah, fellowship with the Father. Um, he also obeyed the Father's will perfectly, right? You can think of in the garden, you know, let not my will, but your will be done. Uh, or how he said, you know, my, my, my food is to do the will of the Father, the one who sent me. Um, and also, Jesus always displayed a strong love for humans. You know, he is compassionate towards the sick and the sorrowful. And, and so to best reflect God, uh, we do that best when we are like Jesus, when we have fellowship with the Father, when we obey what God has said, when we love other people. And that's why God created us in his image. That's what he intends for us to do as humans, that that we have fellowship with him, that we obey his commands, that we love other people. That's what we should all be doing as humans. Um, yeah, and, and so here we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the implications of the fact that God created man in his image, um, and particularly the fact that because God created man, mankind in his image, um, all humans have the image of God. Because of that, all humans deserve respect and have dignity. And um, yeah, so Adam, he was the whole human right, race, right? And then, you know, Eve was the mother of all living. And, you know, they're the parents of of us all and um, we're all their descendants. And so we all also bear the image of God. So does everyone else in Acts, you know, for from one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And so God created Adam in his, in his image um, and we all came from him. And so we all bear the image. And uh, yeah, with that, we know that human life is valuable. 
and it is special, and it is significant. You know, if you think about everything that God has created, you know, think about all the stars, the planets, you know, the, the animals, the, the plants. We are more like our creator than anything else God made. We are the culmination of God's infinitely wise and skillful work of creation. We are like God. We bear his image. You know, when, when God wanted to make something like him, he made us. And with that, we can know for certain that humanity is significant. All humans are significant. And you are significant. Not only that, but all humans are worthy of dignity and respect. And, um, you know, the fact that, that uh, the image of God is not just functional, like it's not just what we do, um, that means you aren't more or less valuable based on your output or your performance. You know, you don't have less dignity if you aren't doing the things that, you know, you think you should or our society tells you that you should. You know, in our achievement-oriented society, it's, um, you know, if you don't have a great job or, or if you can't work, for example, then, you know, some may view you as less worthy. But God does not. It's not based on your performance. It's based on the fact that God created you in his image. And because of that, you are worthy of dignity and respect. Even if you can't work, even if you have a disability, even if you can't, do whatever it is, you know, even if you've been, been unable to do the things that you so desperately want to be able to do, or the things that the people around you say you should be doing. You are created in the image of God. You are significant, and you deserve the dignity and respect that comes with that. And now, you know, not many people would come out and argue like, Actually, I think this group of people is not fully human because they don't, you know, fill in the blanks, so let's treat them differently. Uh, you know, they might not say that, but in reality, they do act like that, or they do think that way. They think of people differently. Um, but that's not God's view, and so we need to acknowledge that. We need to practice a, a godly reverence towards all of humanity and take particular note of those who may be subject to discrimination. Because the special status that God gave Adam and Eve by making them in his image is extended to all members of the human race. And uh, this includes you know, all races or the, the human race. All races are included in God's human family and, and therefore racism and prejudice is wrong. And there have certainly been terrible violations of this. And there still are. But to God, all, all in the human race have dignity and deserve respect. And all may be saved. You know, there's, there's no racial distinction. There's no Jew or Gentile. All are one in Christ Jesus. And so, you know, part of our role as the people of God is to have a proper understanding of the rest of humanity that God has created and to treat them worthy of the status that they have as image bearers of God. Um, this also includes both sexes. You know, women are not second-class citizens in creation and society and the church, and there may be different roles, um, but there is human. There is equality in humanity. There is equality in dignity. And, and that's a particular point stressed in Genesis 1, right? It's male and female he created them in the image of God. Both bear the image of God. And so we know based on that, sexism is wrong. Uh, this applies also to people of all economic statuses, right? The Old Testament talks a lot about God's care for the poor. He warns uh, against mistreatment of the poor, of the, of the oppressed. Um, you know, justice for the poor was, was important, and even Jesus was poor, financially speaking. Um, a hallmark of his ministry was preaching to the poor. And so, you know, people of low economic status are important to God 
too. They bear the image of God. And so they should not be shown prejudice. And, you know, there should not be favoritism. And, and that includes favoritism, you know, against the poor as well as favoritism for the poor, right? Um, really financial status should not bear uh, one way or the other. All statuses deserve justice, righteousness, and respect. Also the unmarried, the unmarried. So, you know, sometimes in our culture, sometimes even in churches, you know, there can be an idea of, oh, you know, married life is the way it's supposed to be. And if you're not, like, what's wrong with that person? Um, they're not good enough or, or, you know, families are more important. Or that to be truly fulfilled, you have to be married. But the reality, the reality is that the unmarried are no less human. They still bear the image of God. And, I mean, just remember, Jesus was not married. I mean, he was not married. And he wasn't just like God. He was he's the exact representation of God. So the unmarried, too, have dignity and deserve respect, and we should make sure we're reflecting that as well. Um, and so, you know, this idea of all humans deserve respect, um, you know, most people would agree with that, right? Even non-believers, yeah, you know, the brotherhood of humanity and let's be kind to people. Um, but the fact is the, that God creating man in his image is what gives the, the foundation for that to be true. That's the reason that can be possible. That's the reason that makes sense. Because if we are, if we really just are machines, then, you know, who's to say that the most productive one isn't worth more, right? If, if we are just animals, then, you know, who's to say you shouldn't just look out for your own interests and do whatever it takes to secure the resources you need to survive, right? If we are just sexual beings, then who's to say, you know, that person shouldn't just force themselves upon you and, or your family member and do whatever they want, right? It's, if we're just sexual creatures, then, you know, who's to say? But it's because humanity has been created in the image of God that all people are significant. They all have dignity and deserve respect. That's why, that's, that's the basis. And so people can say, yeah, you know, you should treat everyone with kindness, but without God creating us all in his image, there's no objective reason for that. And there's an inconsistency in, the, in their worldview. They, they reject God, but hold to a view that requires God creating us all in his image. Um, and so next we're going to get into a category where, you know, the things we talked about, you know, there may be agreement even with the non-believing world. Um, some of these maybe, maybe less so. Um, but one would be the unborn. And here we see that, you know, in the same way that we would view somebody less, you know, we would not view anybody less um, based on, you know, their dependency on others or their inability to do something. Um, you know, we would not do that for somebody outside the womb we would also not view somebody less um, because they're dependent on somebody else or unable to do things just because they're inside the womb. Because the baby in the womb is a person. Less developed, yes, sure. But a person nonetheless that has been created in God's image. And that's why when it comes to the unborn, really the, the first question that has to be asked or answered is um, the question of personhood. Um, that has to come before the question of choice. Because if it is a person in the womb, um, you know, is it, a, is it a person or is it a clump of cells, right? If it is a clump of cells, you know, then removing it is no different than, you know, getting a cyst out. But if it is a person, you can't just choose to end its life. 
any more than I can choose to end your life because you've been created in the image of God. And we believe that the Bible does give us reason to believe that the baby in the womb has moral significance and does have personhood. And um, the classic passage here is Psalm 139. Starting verse 13, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So here David is praising God, right? This, you know, how God was working and, and forming David in the womb and, and creating him. You know, almost like there's a relationship that God had with David even before he was born. You know, God, God knew him. This doesn't seem to refer to a, a pre-personhood state, but you know, David himself was being formed in the womb. Um, there's also another passage, and this isn't uh, quite as common on this topic, but I think can help also in Exodus. Um, so this is right after God gave the Ten Commandments, and um, he's expanding on what's appropriate treatment, uh, an appropriate punishment, right? Uh, so the worst, the worst crimes deserve uh, worse punishment. The punishment shouldn't exceed the crime. Um, and so, you know, we're just going to jump in. It's kind of out there talking about, you know, some fighting guys. Um, but yeah, Exodus 21. Um, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband impose, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And um, there's some disagreement here because uh, in some translations, there where it says. Uh, yeah, the children come out, her children come out. Uh, some translations have that as um, she has a miscarriage. And so the you know, pro-abortion um, side will, will use that verse to say, you know, see if, um, if there is a miscarriage, if, if the baby dies, um, that wasn't really a big deal. You know, Nothing, that was just a fine. It's only if the woman is harmed, is that a big deal? And, you know, then it's eye for eye. Um, but really, the, 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 word, the word does mean the children come out. And uh, it is used that way in other places uh, in the Bible as well. And so with that, the, the proper understanding of this passage is, um, you know, if the ba if you know this situation is going on, baby comes out. If the baby's okay, mom's okay. You know you should pay a fine. That's not okay. Like, you shouldn't be hitting women and making their children be born. Um, but if there is harm, if there's harm to anybody, if there's harm to the mother, if there's harm to the baby, you know the consequences are more severe. You know that's that's really not okay. Um, you know, th there is a moral significance to the mother and the baby. And so, you know, we see even, even in the Old Testament law, you know, far from perfect, looking ahead to the better uh, methods to come. Um, unborn life was still important and it was valuable and it had moral significance. And these are the reasons why we as Christians we view the stakes here as being very high. 
you know, if it's possible, if it's, if it's likely that this is a person in the womb, you know, which verses like this lead us to believe, and, um, you know, we're talking about the possible destruction of a human life. And, you know, this, this is a person that God created in his image, a significant human worthy of dignity, respect, and the life that God gave it. And that's, um, that's why as a church we have adopted a statement on the sanctity of human life. Um, so if you've been in the... Uh, I forget what we call it these days, connecting with Candlewood or the, the new members class thing. If you've been in that recently, then you've seen this. Uh, if you haven't, you might not have seen it already. Um, we're going to go over some of this stuff at our members meeting in January. Um, but this is uh, the statement that we've adopted. We believe that all human life is sacred and created by God in his image. Human life is of inestimable worth in all of its dimensions, including pre-born babies, the aged, the physically or mentally challenged, and every other stage or condition from conception through natural death. We are therefore called to defend, protect, and value all human life. This is what we believe as a church, and this is something that, you know, we are asking our members to be in agreement with, to be a member at Kindlewood. This is an important thing. Now, in talking about, you know, this topic, um, you know, a couple other things we need to say. One is um, there, are, there are some circumstances when it is morally permissible to end a life in the womb. Um, these are some tough situations, tough conversations. Uh, we know that all life is precious in the eyes of God, but an example of a morally permissible abortion is that of a tubal pregnancy. So in a tubal pregnancy, okay, so normally, I've never done this before. Okay, so, you know, baby here in the uterus, right? Tubal pregnancy or an ectopic pregnancy it's outside, right? And so um, basically in, in this situation, there's no way that the mother can survive. Um, but there's also no way that the baby can survive. Um, you know, if the baby stays there, continues to grow, the mother will die. But even if the mother is willing to sacrifice her life for that baby, the baby will still die being outside of the uterus. So unless the baby's life ends, both the mother and the baby will die. Um, and so here's uh, from uh, an ethics book, so John Feinberg. So the only genuine options with an ectopic pregnancy, tubal pregnancy, are either to lose one life, the babies, or to lose two, the mothers and the babies. Not only would an abortion in such cases be morally permissible, it would be the most prudent decision so as to avoid losing both uh, you know, the baby or, and the mother's life as well. Again, very difficult conversations, situations. We can't get into them all, obviously. Um, but I just bring this up to point out, uh, you know, there are difficult situations, um, but there are some when ending life in the womb is not necessarily sinful. And, um, you know, maybe you've wondered that, you know, maybe you have, did we make the right choice? Or, you know, I heard my friend, what, you know, what about that? Um, so bring that up. That doesn't change the fact that all of life is important and precious in, in God's sight. Um, and this situation, for example, is very different from the 93% of abortions in our country that occur for purely social reasons. That is to say, the child is simply unwanted 
or inconvenient. 93% of the abortions in our country are for social reasons, convenience. 6% for potential health problems for the mother or the baby. 1% after a rape or incest. 93% are simply because the child is unwanted or inconvenient. And based on what we read here about God creating all of human life in his image, forming people in the womb, based on what we read about the, the life in the womb having moral significance, and based on the fact that you know, there's, no, there's no difference in the development of the baby, you know, there's no point in time that you can point to and say, oh, oh now it's a person. You know, the, it would all be arbitrary, you know, wherever you would try to draw that line other than fertilization. Um, because of these things, choosing to terminate the life of a baby in the womb, especially just for convenience sake, is terribly wrong. And the fact that in the U.S. there have been over 60 million aborted babies is tragic. You know, that, that's... It's more than the populations of California and Florida combined. Lives snuffed out. Life is valuable. Human life is valuable. All of it, even the unborn. You know, we, we might say especially the unborn. And this is not just a political thing. You know, uh, yesterday the Supreme Court heard oral arguments um, on a case that is the you know, most likely ever to potentially overturn Roe versus Wade and um, Dobson versus Planned Parenthood. Um, may it be so. But even if it's overturned, that doesn't solve the problem. You know, overturning would really just turn things back to the way it was before that, which was, you know, every state gets to make their own laws and some are going to have laws that are very loose and some very restrictive. Um, and you know, we don't, we don't just want people to go farther or try harder to get an abortion. It's not just a matter of change law. We need to help people understand that God values life. To help people understand that there is hope, that there is support, that there are options, that um, you know, we as Christians are willing to put our religion into practice and take care of these babies that are not wanted. You know, that you know, to help people understand that what's best for their life is not premarital sex and that, you know, they can find their identity and their enjoyment and their fulfillment in a relationship with God and to commit to a lifelong marriage before having sex. This is a lot bigger than just a law. This is a, a discipleship thing. Um, another thing that we have to say here is um, to those that have had abortions. I don't know any of your situations, um, but it's estimated that in our country about one in three women will have an abortion at some point in their life. And according to one study, 18% of all U.S. abortions are performed on women who claim to be born-again evangelical Christians. And so this isn't just a theoretical question. So what about those who have had abortions? So we're going to look at a psalm, Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger.
and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide. Nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. What did this father do? What did this father do? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What did this father do? The Father sent his Son to cleanse us from our sin. He paid the price so that we could be freed from our sin. What a God. He he loved us. He loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. What a great God. What a loving God. So that whether you've had an abortion or you have been racist or been prideful when you've you know, sinned against someone else created in the image of God, when you've lusted against someone in your heart and committed adultery in your heart, when you've been angry and murdered somebody in your heart, when you've cursed someone that God has created in his image, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. There is salvation available. There is forgiveness available. And God is with you and God is with us in the healing and recovery process. Praise God. Um, Here are some abortion resources if you want to jot some of these down or grab a picture. So uh, just some websites if they're helpful. Some of these are um, geared towards someone experiencing an unwanted or unexpected pregnancy. Uh, So resources for them. Some of them also are more for, you know, how is we, how can we as Christians uh, help this situation, um, help people, uh, those types of things. Uh, So you can check those out. Um, And then, yeah, okay. Also, the aged and the infirm are also um, all created in the image of God, all have value. You know, in our utilitarian, pragmatic value in society, you know, when someone is older or they're sick, they can't work as much, we can think, oh, they're not as valuable or important. Um, Not the case. Um, Yeah. A lot more to say there. Don't have time. So we'll move on. Um, We'll try to do this quickly. Uh, Our last question, what makes up a human? the constitutional nature of the human. What are we? Uh, So we'll we'll end with this. What are we? Are we just a body? Is there something more? Um, And the answer to this, the nature of human beings, this is from Allison, the nature of human beings consists of a material aspect, the body, uh, and an immaterial aspect, the soul and spirit, uh, united into one person. Uh, So we... 
I'm going to try to go quick through this. So uh, a few different views here. One is monism, which is basically there's just one aspect to humans, and it's just the body. To be human is to have a body. So outside the body, there's, you know, there's no such thing as a human. So you know, if there is eternity, you can only exist there with a resurrected body or, you know, um, the non-Christians would just say nothing happens because all you are is a body. Um, now what we see in the Bible, Genesis 2, 7, you know, God gives the breath of life uh, into the human. Uh, so there's a unified person, the, the, the body and the soul uh, living together. Um, also 2 Corinthians 7, 1, uh, where we are to uh, purify ourselves in both body and spirit. There's a unity. There's more than just a body here. Um, and, you know, that, that's what Christians generally agree on. Uh, you know, there's the body and then there's something else. Um, there are within Christianity two kind of different understandings of uh, what that can be. One is dichotomism which, you know, die from two, cotomism to cut. So there's two, there's like the body, um, and then there's the other stuff, the soul spirit. Um, and then there's also the trichotomism, uh, which says there's actually three parts. Um, so First Thessalonians, um, you know, there's the spirit, the soul, and the body. Those would be the three. Um, yeah, we got to roll through here. So some other verses. Um, there are other verses that say there are more than three. So like Jesus says, the soul and the strength and the mind uh, and your heart. And, you know, those aren't the same as the three. And, you know, we aren't quadimists or whatever. So um, there are also verses that talk about like the soul does this and the soul does that, the spirit does this and the spirit does that. So um, I don't, in my opinion, it's not as important, you know, is it the two or is it the three? Um, overall, what Christians agree on is there's the body and there's something else. There's the immaterial. Uh, we have a body and a soul. At death, we're separated from a time, for our time from our soul. Um, but then, you know, we'll receive our new bodies on the last day. Uh, we'll have a glorified body and enter into eternity. Um, yeah. We're just going to keep going here, wrap up. Okay, so a few, few implications. One, humans are to be treated as unity. Uh, it's important to eat well and sleep well and read your Bible. Right? We are united a united being. Um, we need to be mindful of our emotional needs, our physical needs, our, our spiritual needs. It's all connected. Um, we are complex. We're not like God who's just a spirit. He just has one, one aspect. Um, yeah, the different aspects of our being are to be respected. And, you know, a lot of times we can think, man, if it weren't for this body of mine, like I could really be me or I wouldn't be held back from what I should what I should be doing. Um, you know, I'd be so much better off if it weren't for this darn flesh. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some truth there. Obviously, you know, we are in a sinful, sinful world. And, um, but on the other hand, you know, God created our bodies and he created us in a physical universe. Um, and he said that was good. And, uh, you know, even in eternity, we will be given a new body. The, the normal state of humanity is to have a body. Um, and so, you know, Christian maturity is not about submitting one part of us to the other part. You know, we've all been affected by sin. It's not just our bodies, our, our minds have too. Uh, our, our souls, our, our reasoning. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. We'll just skip that one. Um, so as we look to God and who he is uh, and what he's done, we also see ourselves. And uh, we see creatures of God. That, you know, God created, and God created us to be like him, to represent him. And this is a tremendous privilege um, that he created us in his image. It, it guarantees 
our significance. It also has implications for the way we view those around us, uh, how we treat them. And um, we also see creatures that God made wonderfully complex with, you know, body and, and spirit, body and soul. Uh, and he did that for our good and for our blessing. And we do have a good God. We have a great God. Um, he created us to be like him, to be with him. And he made a way for that to be possible through our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do uh, thank you for your greatness, for your goodness. God, thank you for creating us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for helping us, for joining us in our uh, pursuit to be with you and to be like you and even enabling any of that to happen. And I just thank you for the grace that you've made available to each one of us. I pray that you would help us to live rightly, God, in light of the fact that you've created all of us uh, in your image. And, and we do thank you for doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes uh, in discussion questions. So, um, yeah, let's do that. Okay, Vince, the next one. Yeah, so you can join a table or uh, if you're at your table, we'll, uh, we'll spend a few minutes and then we'll, we'll still close in prayer here. But, uh, so we'll spend a few minutes in discussion.